book eight chapter eleven of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven torn in his feelings as a citizen zwinglius devoted himself with new zeal to the preaching of the gospel urging it with growing energy i will not cease said he to labour to restore the ancient unity of the church of christ he began the year fifteen hundred and twenty two by showing what difference there is between the precepts of the gospel and the precepts of men the season of lent having arrived he raised his voice still more loudly after laying the foundation of the new edifice he wished to clear away the rubbish of the old for four years said he to the multitude assembled in the cathedral you with ardent thirst receive the holy doctrine of the gospel enkindled by the flames of charity fed with the sweets of heavenly manner it is impossible to have still any relish for the sad element of human traditions then attacking compulsory abstinence from flesh for a certain time he exclaimed in his bold eloquence there are some who pretend that it is an evil and even a great sin to eat flesh although god never forbade it and yet do not consider it a crime to sell human flesh to the foreigner and drag it to slaughter the friends of foreign service who were present were filled with indignation and rage at these bold words and vowed not to forget them while preaching thus forcibly zuinglius still continued to say mass he observed the usages established by the church and even abstained from meat on the forbidden days he was persuaded that the first thing necessary was to enlighten the people but certain turbulent spirits did not act with so much wisdom rubli who had become a refugee at zurich allowed himself to be carried away by the impulse of an extravagant zeal the old curate of st alban a bernese captain and conrad huber a member of the great council often met at the house of the last to eat meat on friday and saturday and made a boast of it the question of abstinence was the engrossing topic an inhabitant of lucerne who had come to zurich said to one of his friends there you do wrong in eating flesh during lent the friend answered you lucerne folks also take the liberty of eating it on the forbidden days the inhabitant of lucerne rejoined we have purchased it from the pope the friend replied and we from the butcher if it is a question of money the one is surely as good as the other the council a complaint having been lodged against the transgressors of the ecclesiastical ordinances asked the advice of the curates zwinglius answered that the act of eating meat every day was not blamable in itself but that it ought to be abstained from so long as competent authority had not given any decision on the point the other members of the clergy concurred in this opinion the enemies of the truth took advantage of this favourable circumstance their influence was on the wane victory was on the side of zwinglius it was necessary therefore to make haste and strike a decisive blow they importuned the bishop of constance zwinglius exclaimed they is the destroyer of the flock and not its shepherd ambitious faber the old friend of zwinglius had returned full of zeal for the papacy from a visit which he had just paid to rome from the inspiration of this proud city the first troubles of switzerland were to proceed it was necessary that there should be a decisive struggle between evangelical truth and the representatives of the pontiff it is especially when attacked that the truth manifests its whole power under the shade of opposition and persecution christianity at first acquired the power which overthrew her enemies god was pleased in like manner to conduct his truth through difficult paths at the period of revival which we now describe the priests then as in the days of the apostles assailed the new doctrine 
but for their attacks it might perhaps have remained obscurely hid in some faithful souls but god watched over it to manifest it to the world opposition struck out new paths for it launched it on a new career and fixed the eyes of the nation upon it it was like a breath of wind scattering far and wide seeds which might otherwise have remained inert in the spots on which they fell the tree destined to shelter the helvetic population was indeed planted in the bosom of their valleys but storms were necessary to strengthen the roots and give full development to the branches the partisans of the papacy seeing the fire which was slowly burning in zurich threw themselves upon it to extinguish it and thereby only caused its flames to spread on the afternoon of the seventh of april fifteen twenty two three ecclesiastic deputies from the bishop of constance were seen entering the town of zurich two of them had a stern and angry the third a gentle expression of countenance it was the coadjutor of the bishop melchior batley dr brendy and john vanner preacher of the cathedral an evangelical man who during the whole affair remained silent it was night when luti called in haste on zwinglius and said officers from the bishop have arrived a great blow is preparing all the partisans of ancient customs are in motion a notary has called a meeting of all the priests at an early hour to-morrow morning in the hall of the chapter the assembly of the clergy having accordingly met next day the coadjutor rose and delivered a speech which seemed to his opponents full of violence and pride he affected however not to mention zwinglius by name some priests who had been recently gained to the gospel and were still irresolute were terrified their pale cheeks their silence and their sighs showed that they had lost all courage zwinglius rose and delivered a speech which closed the mouths of his adversaries at zurich as in the other cantons the most violent enemies of the new doctrine were in the lesser council the deputation defeated before the clergy carried their complaints before the magistrates zwinglius was absent and there was no reply to be dreaded the result appeared decisive the gospel and its defenders were on the point of being condemned without a hearing never was the reformation of switzerland in greater danger it was going to be stifled in the cradle the councillors in favour of zwinglius appealed to the great council it was the only remaining plank for escape and god employed it to save the cause of the gospel the two hundred were convened the partisans of the papacy used every mean to exclude zwinglius who on the other hand did all he could to gain admission as he himself expresses it he knocked at every door and left not a stone unturned but all in vain the thing is impossible said the burgomasters the council has decreed the contrary then relates zwinglius i remained quiet and with deep sighs carried the matter before him who hears the groaning of the prisoner supplicating him to defend his own gospel the patient resigned waiting of the servants of god is never disappointed on the ninth of april the two hundred assembled we wish to have our pastors here immediately exclaimed the members who were in favour of the reformation the lesser council resisted but the great council decided that the pastors should be present to hear the charge and answer it if they thought fit the deputies from constance were introduced and then the three curates of zurich zwinglius engelhardt and old rushley after the parties thus brought face to face had for some time eyed each other the coadjutor rose had his heart and his head been equal to his voice says zwinglius he would in sweetness have surpassed apollo and orpheus and in force the gracchi and demosthenes the civil constitution said the champion of the papacy and christianity itself are threatened men have appeared teaching new offensive and seditious doctrines then after speaking at great length he fixed his eye on the assembled senate and said 
remain with the church remain in the church out of it none can be saved ceremonies alone can bring the simple to the knowledge of salvation and the pastors of the flocks have nothing else to do than explain their meaning to the people as soon as the coadjutor had finished his speech he and his party were preparing to leave the council hall when zwinglius said to him warmly mr coadjutor and you who accompany him remain i pray you till i have defended myself the coadjutor we are not employed to dispute with any man whatever zwinglius i mean not to dispute but to explain to you without fear what i have taught up to this hour burgomaster roused to the deputies of constance i pray you listen to the curate's reply the coadjutor i too well know the man with whom i would have to do ulrich zwinglius is too violent for any man to dispute with zwinglius when did it become the practice to attack an innocent man so strongly and afterwards refuse to hear him in the name of our common faith in the name of the baptism which both of us have received in the name of christ the author of salvation and life listen to me if you cannot as deputies at least do it as christians after firing a volley into the air rome retired with hasty steps from the field of battle the reformer only asked to speak and the agent of the papacy thought only of flight a cause thus pleaded was already gained on the one side and lost on the other the two hundred could not contain their indignation a murmur burst forth in the assembly the burgomaster again pressed the deputies they felt ashamed and silently resumed their seats then zwinglius said the coadjutor speaks of seditious doctrines subversive of civil laws let him know that zurich is quieter and more obedient to the laws than any other town in switzerland and this all good citizens attribute to the gospel is not christianity the most powerful safeguard of justice among a people what a ceremony is good for unless it be to sully the face of christ and christians yes there is another method than these vain observances to bring simple people to the knowledge of the truth a method which christ and the apostles followed in the gospel itself have no dread of its not being comprehended by the people whoever believes comprehends the people can believe and therefore can comprehend this is a work of the divine spirit and not of human reason for the rest he who does not find forty days sufficient may for me if he likes fast every day in the year all i ask is that nobody be compelled to do so and that for neglect of the minutest observance the zurichers be not accused of separating from the communion of christians i did not say so exclaimed the coadjutor no said his colleague dr brendy he did not say it but the whole senate confirmed the assertion of zwinglius who continued worthy citizens let not this accusation move you the foundation of the church is that rock that christ who gave peter his name because he confessed him faithfully in every nation whosoever believeth with the heart in the lord jesus christ is saved this is the church out of which no man can be saved as to us ministers of christ to explain the gospel and follow it is the whole of our duty let those who live by ceremonies make it their business to explain them this was to touch the sore part the coadjutor blushed and said nothing the two hundred adjourned and afterwards the same day decided that the pope and cardinals should be requested to explain the controverted point and that in the meantime flesh should not be eaten during lent this was to leave matters on the old footing and answer the bishop in such a way as to gain time this struggle had advanced the work of the reformation the champions of rome and of the reformation had been in the presence of each other and before the eyes of the whole community and the advantage had not been on the side of the pope 
this was the first engagement in what was to be a long and severe campaign and to exhibit many alternations of grief and joy but a first victory at the outset gives courage to the whole army and fills the enemy with dismay the reformation had obtained possession of a territory of which it was not again to be deprived if the council deemed it necessary to proceed with some degree of caution the people loudly proclaimed the defeat of rome never said they in the exultation of the moment never will they be able to reassemble their beaten and scattered troops you said they to zwinglius have with the spirit of st paul attacked these false apostles and their ananias their whited walls the utmost the satellites of antichrist can now do is to gnash their teeth against you voices were heard from the centre of germany joyfully proclaiming the glory of reviving theology at the same time however the enemies of the gospel mustered their forces if they were to strike there was no time to be lost for it would soon be beyond the reach of their blows hoffmann laid before the chapter a long accusation against the reformer were the curate even able said he to prove by witnesses what sins what irregularities have been committed by ecclesiastics in such a convent such a street such a tavern it would still be his duty not to give any names why does he give out it is true i have scarcely ever heard him myself that he alone draws his doctrine at the fountain-head and that others search for it only in sinks and puddles is it not impossible seeing the diversity of spirits for all to preach the same thing zwinglius defended himself at a full meeting of the chapter scattering the accusations of his opponent as a bull with his horns tosses straw into the air the affair which had appeared so serious ended in laughter at the canon's expense but zwinglius did not stop here on the sixteenth of april he published a treatise on the free use of food end of book eight chapter eleven book eight chapter twelve of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the remover's immovable firmness delighted the friends of truth and particularly the evangelical christians of germany so long deprived by the captivity of the wartburg of the mighty apostle who had first raised his head in the bosom of the church pastors and faithful people now exiled by the inexorable decree which the papacy had obtained at worms from charles v found an asylum in zurich nesse the professor of frankfurt whom luther visited when on his way to worms in a letter to zwinglius says oh how i am delighted to learn with what authority you preach christ speak words of encouragement to those who by the cruelty of wicked bishops are obliged to flee far from our churches in sorrow but the adversaries of the reformation did not confine their cruel plots against its friends to germany scarcely an hour passed at zurich in which the means of getting rid of zwinglius were not under consideration one day he received an anonymous letter which he immediately communicated to his two vicars it said snares environ you on every side mortal poison is ready to deprive you of life eat only in your own house and of bread baked by your own cook the walls of zurich contain men who are plotting your ruin the oracle which revealed this to me is truer than that of delphi i am on your side you will yet know me the day following that on which zwinglius received this mysterious letter at the moment when Steheli was going to enter the church of o a chaplain stopped him and said make all haste and quit the house of zwinglius a catastrophe is preparing fanatics in despair of being able to arrest the reformation by word armed themselves with the poniard 
when mighty revolutions are accomplished in society assassins are often thrown up from the impure dregs of the agitated population god guarded zwinglius while murderers saw their plot defeated the legitimate organs of the papacy again began to agitate the bishop and his counsellors were determined to renew the war from every quarter information to this effect reached zwinglius who leaning on the divine promise exclaimed with noble confidence i fear them as a lofty shore fears the threatening waves on the second of may the bishop of constance published an order in which without naming either zurich or zwinglius he complained of the attempts of artful persons to renew the condemned doctrines and of discussions by the learned and the ignorant in all places on the most solemn mysteries john vanner the preacher of the cathedral of constance was the first that was attacked i would rather said he be a christian with the hatred of many than abandon christ for the friendship of the world but it was at zurich that the growing heresy required to be crushed faber and the bishop knew that zinglius had several enemies among the canons and they were desirous to turn this hatred to account toward the end of may a letter from the bishop arrived at zurich addressed to the provost and his chapter sons of the church said the prelate let them perish that will perish but let no one sever you from the church at the same time the bishop urged the canons to prevent the false doctrines engendered by pernicious sects from being preached and discussed whether in private or in public when this letter was read in the chapter all eyes were turned upon zwinglius who understanding what was meant said i see you think that this letter concerns me have the goodness to put it into my hand and by the help of god i will answer it zwinglius did reply in his archeteles a word which signifies the beginning and the end for i hope said he that this first answer will also be the last he spoke in it in very respectful terms of the bishop and attributed all the attacks of his enemies to some intriguers what then have i done said he i have called all men to the knowledge of their maladies i have laboured to bring them to the true god and to his son jesus christ with that view i have employed not captious exhortations but words simple and true such as the sons of switzerland can comprehend then passing from the defensive and becoming the assailant he finally adds julius caesar feeling himself mortally wounded endeavoured to draw up the folds of his robe that he might fall in a becoming manner the fall of your ceremonies is at hand act so at least they may fall decently and that in every place light may be quickly substituted for darkness this was all that the bishop gained by his letter to the chapter of zurich now therefore that friendly remonstrances were vain it was necessary to strike more decisive blows faber and landenberg turned in another direction towards the diet the national council there deputies from the bishop arrived to state that their master had issued an order prohibiting all the priests of his diocese from innovating in matters of doctrine but that his authority being disregarded he now wished the aid of the heads of the confederation to assist him in bringing the rebellious to obedience and defending the true and ancient faith the enemies of the reformation were in a majority in this first assembly of the nation which a short time before had issued a decree prohibiting the preaching of all priests whose discourses as it was expressed produced discord among the people this decree of the diet which thus for the first time took up the question of the reformation had no result but now having determined on vigorous measures this body summoned before it urban weiss pastor of feilishbach near baden whom public rumour charged with preaching the new faith and rejecting the old weiss was respited for some time on the intercession of several individuals and on bail for a hundred florins offered by his parishioners 
but the diet had taken its part and having just given proof of it the priests and monks began everywhere to resume courage at zurich even after the first decree they had begun to behave more imperiously several members of council were in the practice morning and evening of visiting the three convents and even taking their victuals there the monks laboured to indoctrinate their kind table companions and urge them to procure a decree of the government in their favour if zwinglius won't be silent said they we will cry louder still the diet had taken part with the oppressors the council of zurich knew not what to do on the seventh of june it issued an order forbidding any one to preach against the monks but scarcely was the order resolved upon than says the chronicle of bullinger a sudden noise was heard in the council chamber and made every one look at his neighbour peace was not re-established the war waged from the pulpit waxed hotter and hotter the council named a deputation who called the pastors of zurich and the readers and preachers of the convents to meet them in the provost's house after a keen discussion the burgomaster enjoined the two parties not to preach anything which might interrupt concord i cannot accept this injunction said zwinglius i mean to preach the gospel freely and unconditionally in conformity to the resolution previously adopted i am bishop and pastor of zurich it is to me that the care of souls has been entrusted it was i that took the oath not the monks they ought to yield not i if they preach lies i will contradict them and that even in the pulpit of their own convent if i myself preach a doctrine contrary to the holy gospel then i ask to be rebuked not only by the chapter but by any citizen whatever and moreover to be punished by the council we said the monks we demand to be permitted to preach the doctrines of st thomas the committee of the council having deliberated ordered that thomas scotus and the other doctors should be let alone and nothing preached but the holy gospel thus the truth had once more gained the victory but the wrath of the partisans of the papacy increased the ultramontane canons could not conceal their anger they impertinently eyed zwinglius in the chapter and by their looks seemed to demand his life zwinglius was not deterred by their menaces there was one place in zurich where thanks to the dominicans the light had not yet penetrated this was the nunnery of Etenbach. the daughters of the first families of zurich there took the veil it seemed unjust that these poor females confined within the walls of their monastery should alone be excluded from hearing the word of god the great council ordered zwinglius to repair to it and the reformer having mounted a pulpit which had hitherto been given up to the dominicans preached on the clearness and certainty of the word of god he at a later period published this remarkable discourse which was not without fruit and irritated the monks still more a circumstance occurred to augment this hatred and give it a place in many other hearts the swiss headed by stein and winkelried had just experienced a bloody defeat at beacock they had rushed impetuously on the enemy but the artillery of pesquer and the lancers of that freundsberg whom luther had met at the door of the hall of worms had thrown down both leaders and colours whole companies falling and disappearing at once winkelried and stein mullinen diesbachs bochstettens schudis and pfeifers were left on the battlefield schwitz especially had been mown down the bloody wrecks of this dreadful conflict had returned to switzerland spreading mourning at every step a wail of grief had resounded from the alps to the jura and from the rhone to the rhine but none had felt a deeper pang than zwinglius he immediately sent an address to schwitz dissuading its citizens from foreign service your ancestors said he to them with all the warmth of a swiss heart forgot their enemies in defence of their liberties but they never put christians to death in order to gain money 
these foreign wars bring innumerable calamities on our country the scourges of god chastise our confederacy and helvetic freedom is on the eve of being lost between the selfish caresses and the mortal hatred of foreign princes zwinglius went hand in hand with nicholas flew and renewed the entreaties of that man of peace this exhortation having been presented to the assembly of the people of schwitz had such an effect that a resolution was passed to desist prospectively for twenty-five years from capitulation but the french party soon succeeded in getting the generous resolution rescinded and schwitz was thenceforth the canton most decidedly opposed to zwinglius and his works the very disasters which the partisans of foreign capitulation brought upon their country only increased the hatred of those men against the bold minister who endeavoured to rescue his country from all this misfortune and all this disgrace thus throughout the confederation a party which daily grew more and more violent was formed against Zurich and zwinglius the customs of the church and the practices of the recruiters being at once attacked they made common cause in resisting the impetus of reform by which their existence was threatened at the same time external enemies multiplied not merely the pope but other foreign princes also vowed inextinguishable hatred to the reformation because it was aiming to deprive them of those helvetic halberds to which their ambition and their pride owed so many triumphs but the cause of the gospel had still god on its side and the best among the people this was sufficient besides individuals from different countries exiled for their faith were led by the hand of providence to give switzerland their aid End of book eight chapter twelve Book Eight, Chapter Thirteen of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mail d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen. On Saturday, the twelfth of July, there was seen entering the streets of Zurich a monk, tall, thin, stiff, gaunt clad in a grey cordelia frock and mounted upon an ass he had the look of a foreigner and his bare feet almost touched the ground he arrived thus by the road from avignon he did not know one word of german but by means of latin succeeded in making himself understood francis lambert this was his name asked for zwinglius and delivered him a letter from berthold haller the franciscan father wrote the bernese curate who is no less than the apostolic preacher of the general convent of avignon has for nearly five years been teaching christian truth he has preached in latin to our priests at geneva at lausanne in the presence of the bishop at freiburg and finally at bern his subjects were the church the priesthood the sacrifice of the mass the traditions of the roman bishops and the superstitions of the religious orders it seemed to me wonderful to hear such things from a cordelia and a frenchman circumstances both of which as you know imply a host of superstitions the frenchman himself related to zwinglius how the writings of luther having been discovered in his cell he had been obliged to take a hasty leave of avignon how he had first preached the gospel at geneva and thereafter at lausanne zwinglius overjoyed gave the monk access to the church of notre dame assigning him a seat in the choir near the high altar lambert here delivered four sermons in which he forcibly attacked the errors of rome but in the fourth he defended the invocation of the saints and the virgin brother you are in error immediately exclaimed an animated voice it was the voice of zwinglius canons and chaplains thrilled with joy when they saw a quarrel rising between the frenchman and the heretical curate he has attacked you said they all to lambert demand a public discussion the man of avignon did so and at ten o'clock in the morning of the twelfth of july the two chaplains met in the hall of the canons 
Zwinglius opened the Old and New Testament in Greek and Latin. He discussed and lectured till two. Then the French monk, clasping his hands and raising them towards heaven, exclaimed, I thank thee, O God, that thou hast by this illustrious instrument given me such a clear knowledge of the truth. Henceforth, added he, turning towards the assembly, in all my distresses I will invoke God only, and leave off my beads. Tomorrow I resume my journey. I go to Baal to see Erasmus of Rotterdam, and thence to Wittenberg to see the monk Martin Luther. He accordingly remounted his ass and set out. We will again meet with him. He was the first exile from France for the cause of the gospel who appeared in Switzerland and Germany, a modest forerunner of many thousands of refugees and confessors. Myconius had no such consolation. On the contrary, he saw Sebastian Hofmeister, who had come from Constance to Lucerne and there boldly preached the gospel, obliged to quit the city. Then Oswald's grief increased. The moist climate of Lucerne disagreed with him. He was wasted by fever, and the physicians declared that if he did not change his residence, he would die. Writing to Zwinglius, he says, there is no place I should like better to be than beside yourself, and no place worse than at Lucerne. Men torture, and the climate consumes me. My disease, some say, is the punishment of my iniquity. Ah, it is vain to speak, vain to act. Everything is poison to them. There is one in heaven on whom alone my hope depends. This hope was not vain. It was towards the end of March, and the Feast of the Annunciation was at hand. The evening before there was a great solemnity in commemoration of a fire which in 1540 had reduced the greater part of the town to ashes. Multitudes from the surrounding districts had flocked into Lucerne, and several hundreds of priests were then assembled. Some distinguished orator was usually employed to preach on this great occasion. Conrad Schmidt, commander of the Johannites, arrived to discharge the duty. An immense crowd thronged the church. What was the general astonishment on hearing the commander lay aside the pompous Latin to which they had been accustomed, and speak in good German, so that all could comprehend him, enforce with authority and holy fervour the love of god in sending his son eloquently prove that external works cannot save and that the promises of god are truly the power of the gospel god forbid said the commander to his astonished audience that we should receive a chief so full of lies as the bishop of rome and reject jesus christ if the bishop of rome dispenses the bread of the gospel let us receive him as pastor but not as head and if he does not dispense it let us not receive him in any way whatever oswald was unable to restrain his joy what a man exclaimed he what a discourse what majesty what authority what overflowing of the spirit of christ the impression was general to the agitation which filled the town succeeded a solemn silence but all this was transient when nations shut their ears against the calls of god these calls are diminished from day to day and soon cease thus it was at lucerne at bern while the truth was preached from the pulpit the papacy was attacked at the merry-makings of the people Nicholas Manuel, a distinguished layman, celebrated for his poetical talents and advanced to the first offices in the state, indignant at seeing his countrymen pillaged by Samson, composed carnival dramas in which, with the keen weapon of satire, he attacked the avarice, pride and luxury of the Pope and the clergy. On the Shrove Tuesday of the Lords, the clergy were at this time the Lords, and began Lent eight days before the common people, all Bairn was engrossed with a drama or mystery entitled The Eaters of the Dead, which young boys were going to perform in the street of La Croix. The people flocked to it in crowds. 
in regard to the progress of art these dramatic sketches of the beginning of the sixteenth century are of some interest but we give them here with a very different view we would have been better pleased not to have had to quote squibs of this description on the part of the reformation for truth triumphs by other arms but the historian does not make his facts he must give them as he finds them at length to the delight of the eager crowds assembled in the street of la croix the representation began the pope is seen clad in gorgeous robes and seated on a throne around him stand his courtiers his bodyguards and a promiscuous band of priests of high and low degree behind are nobles laymen and mendicants a funeral train shortly appears it is a rich farmer on the way to his last home two of his relatives walk slowly in front of the coffin with napkins in their hand the train having arrived in front of the pope the bier is laid down at his feet and the drama begins first relative in a tone of deep grief o noble army of the sainted host take pity on our doleful plight our cousin our illustrious boast from life alas has taken flight expense we grudge not cheerfully we'll pay for priests monks and nuns in costly array yea one hundred crowns we'll freely devote if thereby exemption may surely be bought from purgatory that dread scourge with which our frightened souls they urge the sacristan breaking off from the band surrounding the pope and running hastily to curate robert evermore something to drink master curate i crave a farmer of note now goes to his grave the curate one nay you must tell me of ten my thirst will ne'er be quenched till then life flourishes when mortals die for death to me brings jollity the sacristan ah could it shorten mankind's breath i'd ring a merry peal for death no other trade succeeds so well as tolling out life's parting knell the curate but does the bell of death the portals draw of heaven's gate wide i cannot may not say what boots it to my house it brings both fish and flesh and all good things the curate's niece tis well i too anon will claim my share this day this soul must pay to me my fare a robe white red and green a flowered damas a pretty kerchief likewise for my eyes at mass cardinal high pride adorned with a red hat and close by the pope if death brought us no heritage would we cause to die in flower of age on battle plain such heaps of slain roused by intrigue by envy fired yes rome with christian blood grows fat therefore i hoist this scarlet hat to tell the trophies thus acquired bishop wolf belly in papal rites i'll live and die and clothe me in silk embroidery in foray or chase i'll take my pleasure and eat and drink in ample measure had i been priest in days of yore a peasant's dress i then had wore we once were shepherds but now we reign kings for a shepherd i'll pass mong the lambkins poor things a voice when when shall this be bishop when the wool of the flock shall be gathered by me we truly are wolves yet we're shepherds of sheep they must feed us or death is the best they shall reap his holiness forbids to marry this yoke the wisest ne'er could carry but then when priests do cross the score the scandal only swells my store and makes my train extend the more nought i refuse in farthings tell a moneyed priest may have a bell four florins a year will wipe it away does an infant appear again he must pay on two thousand florins i reckon each year were they chaste i should starve on a pittance i fear then hail to the pope on my knees i adore and swear in his faith to live evermore his church i'll defend and till death i avow he alone is the god before whom i will bow 
the pope the people now at length believe that priests can all their sins reprieve at pleasure that to them is given full power to shut or open heaven preach loudly every high decree of him the conclave's majesty then we are kings the laity slaves but if the gospel standard waves we're lost for nowhere does it say make sacrifice let priests have pay the gospel course for us would be to live and die in poverty instead of steeds to mark my state and chariots on my sons to wait a paltry ass must needs supply a seat for sacred majesty no i cannot take such legacy i'll thunder at such temerity let us but will the world will nod and nations adore us as god slighting their rights i mount my throne and partition the world among my own vile laity must keep far aloof nor dare to enter our blessed roof to touch our tribute or our gold holy water e'en let them hold we will not continue this literal translation of manuel's drama the agony of the clergy on learning the efforts of the reformers and their rage against those who threaten to interfere with their irregularities are painted in lively colours the dissolute manners of which this piece gave so vivid a representation were too common not to strike the spectator with the truth of the picture the people were excited many jibes were heard as they retired from the play in the street of la croix but some who took the matter more seriously spoke of christian liberty and papal despotism and contrasted the simplicity of the gospel with the pomp of rome the contempt of the people was soon displayed in the public streets on ash wednesday the indulgences were promenaded through the town amid satirical songs in bern and throughout switzerland a severe blow had been given to the ancient edifice of the papacy some time after this representation another comedy was acted at bern but there was no fiction in it the clergy council and corporation had assembled in front of the upper gate waiting for the skull of st anne which the famous knight albert of stein had gone to fetch from lyon at length stein appeared holding the holy relic wrapped in a covering of silk as it passed the bishop of lausanne knelt down before it this precious skull the skull of the virgin's mother is carried in procession to the church of the dominicans and amid the ringing of bells enters the church where it is placed with great solemnity on the altar consecrated to it behind a splendid grating but amid all this joy a letter arrives from the abbot of the convent of lyon where the relics of the saint were deposited intimating that what the monks had sold to the knight was a profane bone taken at random from the burying ground the trick thus played off on the illustrious city of berne filled its citizens with deep indignation the reformation was making progress in other parts of switzerland in fifteen hundred and twenty one walter clare a young man of appenzel returned to his native canton from the university of paris luther's writings fell into his hands and in fifteen twenty two he preached the evangelical doctrine with all the ardour of a young convert an innkeeper named rausberg a wealthy and pious man and a member of the council of appenzel opened his house to all the friends of the truth bartholomew berwege a famous captain who had fought for julius the second and for leo the tenth having at this time returned from rome began forthwith to persecute the evangelical ministers one day however remembering how much vice he had seen at rome he began to read the bible and to attend the sermons of the new preachers his eyes were opened and he embraced the gospel seeing that the crowds could not be contained in the churches he proposed that they should preach in the fields and the public squares and notwithstanding of keen opposition the hills meadows and mountains of appenzel thenceforward often echoed with the glad tidings of salvation the reformed doctrine ascending the rhine made its way as far as ancient raetia one day a stranger from zurich crossed the river and waited on the saddler of flash the frontier village of the grison 
Christian Anhorn, the saddler, listened in astonishment to the language of his visitor. Preach, said the whole village to the stranger, who was called James Berkeley. He accordingly took his station in front of the altar. A number of persons arrived, with Anhorn at their head, and stood round to defend him from a sudden attack while he preached the gospel. The rumour of this preaching spread far and wide, and on the following Sunday an immense crowd assembled. Shortly after, a great proportion of the inhabitants of the district desired to have the Lord's Supper dispensed to them according to its original institution. But one day the toxin, or alarm, suddenly sounded in Mayenfield. The people ran in alarm, and the priests, after pointing out the danger which threatened the church, hastened at the head of the fanatical population to flash. Anhorn, who was working in the field, astonished at hearing the sound of bells at so unusual an hour, hastened home and concealed Berkeley in a deep hole dug in his cellar. The house was by this time surrounded, the door was forced open, and the heretical preacher everywhere searched for, in vain. At length the persecutors withdrew. The word of God spread over the extent of the ten jurisdictions. The curate of Mayenfield, on returning from Rome, to which he had fled, infuriated at the success of the gospel, exclaimed, Rome has made me evangelical, and became a zealous reformer. The Reformation soon extended to the League of the House of God. Oh, exclaimed Salandronius to Vadian, if you but saw how the inhabitants of the mountains of Raetia cast far from them the yoke of the Babylonish captivity. Shocking disorders hastened the day when Zurich and the neighbouring districts were to shake off the yoke. A married schoolmaster, wishing to become a priest, obtained his wife's consent, and they separated. The new curate was unable to keep his vow of celibacy, but, not to outrage his wife's feelings, quitted the place where she lived, and, having taken up his residence in the Diocese of Constance, formed a licentious connection. His wife hastened to the place. The poor priest took compassion on her, and, dismissing the person who had usurped her rights, took back his lawful spouse. The procurator fiscal forthwith drew up a charge against him. The vicar-general began to move. The council of the consistory deliberated, and the curate was ordered to abandon his wife or his benefice. The poor wife left the house weeping bitterly, and her rival returned in triumph. The church declared itself satisfied, and thenceforth let the adulterous priest alone. Shortly after, a curate of Lucerne eloped with a married woman and lived with her. The husband went to Lucerne, and, taking advantage of the priest's absence, brought away his wife. While returning, they were met by the seducer, who immediately attacked the injured husband and gave him a wound of which he died. All good men felt the necessity of re-establishing the divine law which declares marriage honourable in all. The evangelical ministers had taught that the law of celibacy was of merely human origin, imposed by Roman pontiffs in opposition to the word of God, which, when describing a true bishop, represents him as a husband and father. 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 and 4 they saw at the same time that of all the abuses which had crept into the church none had caused more numerous vices and scandals. They considered it not only as a thing lawful, but as a duty in the sight of God to withdraw from its authority. Several of them at this time returned to the ancient practice of apostolic times. Xylotect was married. Zwinglius also married at this period. No lady was more respected in Zurich than Anna Reinhardt, widow of Meyer of Knonau, the mother of Gerald. From the arrival of Zwinglius, she had been one of his most attentive hearers. She lived in his neighbourhood, and he observed her piety, modesty, and fondness for her children. Young Gerald, who had become, as it were, his adopted son, brought him into closer connection with his mother. The trials already endured by this Christian woman, who was one day to be the most cruelly tried of all the women whose history is on record, had given her a gravity which made her evangelical virtues still more prominent. 
she was now about thirty-five years of age and her own fortune amounted to only four hundred florins it was on her that zwinglius on looking out for a companion for life turned his eye he felt how sacred and intimate the conjugal union is he termed it a most holy alliance as christ said he died for his people and gave himself to them entirely so ought husband and wife to do and suffer everything for each other but zwinglius when he took anna reinhardt to wife did not immediately publish his marriage this was undoubtedly a culpable weakness in a man otherwise so resolute the light which he and his friends had acquired on the subject of celibacy was not generally diffused the weak might have been offended he feared that his usefulness in the church might be paralyzed if his marriage were made public he sacrificed part of his happiness to these fears fears to which though respectable perhaps he should have been superior end of book eight chapter thirteen Book Eight, Chapter Fourteen of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mail d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen. Meanwhile, still higher interests occupied the friends of truth the diet as we have seen urged by the enemies of the reformation had ordered the evangelical preachers to desist from preaching the doctrines which troubled the people zwinglius felt that the moment for action had arrived and with the energy which characterized him called a meeting of the ministers of the lord the friends of the gospel at einsiedlin the strength of christians is neither in carnal weapons nor the flames of martyrdom it is in a simple but unanimous and intrepid profession of these great truths to which the world must one day be subjugated in particular god calls upon those who serve him to hold these heavenly doctrines prominently forth in the presence of the whole people without being dismayed by the clamour of adversaries those truths are able of themselves to secure their triumph and as of old with the ark of god idols cannot stand in their presence the time had come when god willed that the great doctrine of salvation should be confessed in switzerland it was necessary that the gospel standard should be planted on some eminence providence was going to draw humble but intrepid men out of unknown retreats that they might bear a striking testimony in the presence of the nation towards the end of june and the beginning of july fifteen hundred and twenty two pious ministers were seen proceeding in all directions towards the celebrated chapel of einsiedlen on a new pilgrimage from art in the canton of schwitz came its curate balthasar traschel from weiningen near baden curate stehelle from zug werner steiner from lucerne canon kirchmeier from Uster, curate fiesta from hong near zurich curate stumpf from zurich itself canon fabricius chaplain schmidt the preacher of the hospital grossmann and zwinglius leo judah curate of einsiedlen most cordially welcomed all these ministers of jesus christ to the ancient abbey since the time when zwinglius took up his residence in it this place had been a citadel of truth and a hotel of the just in like manner had thirty-three bold patriots resolved to break the yoke of austria met two hundred years before in the solitary plain of grutli the object of the meeting at einsiedlen was to break the yoke of human authority in the things of god zwinglius proposed to his friends to present earnest addresses to the cantons and to the bishop praying for the free preaching of the gospel and at the same time for the abolition of compulsory celibacy the source of so many irregularities the proposal was unanimously adopted ulrich had himself prepared the addresses that to the bishop was first read it was dated second of july fifteen twenty two and signed by all the evangelists we have mentioned the preachers of the truth in switzerland were united in cordial affection 
Many others besides sympathized with the party at Einsiedlen. Such were Haller, Myconius, Hedio, Capito, Echolampadius, Sebastian Meyer, Hofmeister, and Vanner. This harmony is one of the finest traits in the Swiss Reformation. These excellent persons always acted as one man and remained friends till death. The men of Einsiedlen were aware that it was only by the power of faith that the members of the Confederation, divided by foreign enlistments, could become one body. But their views were carried higher. The celestial doctrine, said they to their ecclesiastical head in the address of 2nd of July, that truth which God the Creator has manifested by His Son to the human race now plunged in evil, has been long veiled from our eyes by the ignorance, not to say the malice, of certain men. But God Almighty has resolved to re-establish it in its primitive condition. Join yourself to those who demand that the multitude of the faithful return to their head, who is Christ. For our part, we have resolved to promulgate his gospel with indefatigable perseverance, and at the same time with such wisdom that none can complain. Favour this enterprise, astonishing, perhaps, but not rash. Be like Moses on the march at the head of the people coming out of Egypt, and overthrow the obstacles which oppose the triumphant progress of truth. After this warm appeal, the evangelists met at Einsiedlen came to celibacy. Zwinglius had no longer any demand to make on this head for himself, having already one answering to the description given by Paul of what a minister's wife ought to be, grave, sober, faithful in all things, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 2. But he thought of his brethren, whose consciences were not yet like his, emancipated from human ordinances. He sighed, moreover, for the time when all the servants of God might live openly and without fear in the bosom of their own family, keeping their children, says the Apostle, in subjection with all gravity. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. You are not ignorant, said the men of Einsiedlen, that hitherto chastity has been deplorably violated by the priests when on the consecration of the servants of the lord he who speaks for all is asked are those whom you present righteous he answers they are righteous are they learned they are learned but when he is asked are they chaste he answers as far as human weakness permits everything in the new testament condemns licentiousness everything in it sanctions marriage then follows the quotation of a great number of passages. Wherefore, they continued, we implore you, by the love of Christ, by the liberty which he has purchased for us, by the misery of so many weak and wavering souls, by the wounds of so many ulcerated consciences, by everything human and divine, allow that which was rashly done to be wisely repealed lest the majestic edifice of the church fall with fearful uproar and drag boundless ruin after it see with what storms the world is threatened if wisdom interpose not it is all over with the priesthood the petition to the confederation was of greater length the band of einsiedlen addressing the confederates thus conclude Honoured sirs, we are all Swiss, and you are our fathers. There are some among us who have shown themselves faithful in combat, in plague, and other calamities. It is in the name of true chastity that we speak to you. Who knows not that we could satisfy sensual appetite far better by not submitting to the laws of a legitimate union? But it is necessary to put an end to the scandals which afflict the Church of Christ. If the tyranny of the Roman pontiff would oppress us, fear nothing, brave heroes. The authority of the word of God, and the rights of Christian liberty, and the sovereign power of grace guard around us. We have the same country, we have the same faith, we are Swiss, and the valour of our illustrious ancestors always manifested its power by an indomitable defence of those oppressed by injustice. 
thus in einsiedlen itself in this old rampart of superstition which is still in our day one of the most famous sanctuaries of roman superstition zwinglius and his friends boldly raised the standard of truth and freedom they appealed to the heads of the state and the church they fixed their thesis like luther both on the gate of the episcopal palace and on that of the national council the friends met at Einsiedland, parted calm, joyful, full of hope in that God to whom they had committed their cause. Some passing near the battlefield of Morgarten, others over the chain of the Albis, and others again by different valleys or mountains, all returned to their posts. There was truly something grand in these times, says Henry Bullinger, in men thus daring to put themselves forward, rallying around the gospel, and exposing themselves to all dangers. But God defended them, so that no evil reached them. For God preserves his people at all times. It was indeed something grand. It was a great step in the progress of the Reformation, one of the brightest days of religious revival in switzerland a holy confederation was formed at einsiedlen humble and courageous men had seized the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and the shield of faith the gauntlet was thrown down and the challenge given not by a single man but by men of different cantons ready to sacrifice their lives it only remained to await the battle everything announced that it was to be fierce five days after seventh of july the magistracy of zurich wishing to give some satisfaction to the roman party summoned before them conrad grebel and klaus hottinger two of those extreme men who seemed desirous to go beyond the bounds of a wise reformation we forbid you said burgomaster roust to speak against the monks or on controverted points at these words a loud noise was heard in the chamber says an ancient chronicle god was so manifestly in favour of the work that people were everywhere anticipating signs of his interposition all present looked around in astonishment without being able to discover the cause of this mysterious circumstance but indignation was carried to its greatest height in convents every meeting held in them whether for discipline or festivity witnessed some new attack one day when a great festival was celebrated in the convent of fraubrunn the wine having got into the heads of the guests they began to shoot the most envenomed arrows at the gospel what especially excited the rage of these priests and monks was the evangelical doctrine that in the christian church there ought to be no sacerdotal caste above believers only one friend of the reformation a simple layman macrin schoolmaster at solcure was present he at first shunned the contest by changing his seat to another table but at last no longer able to endure the furious invectives of the guests he stood up boldly and exclaimed yes all true christians are priests and offer sacrifice according to the words of st peter you are a royal priesthood at these words one of the most intrepid ballers the dean of burgdorf a tall stout man with a stentorian voice uttered a loud laugh you little greeks and school rats you a royal priesthood beautiful priesthood mendicant kings priests without prebends and benefices and instantly all the priests and monks fell with one accord on the impudent laic but it was in lucerne that the bold step of the men of einsiedlen was to produce the strongest sensation the diet had met in this town and complaints arrived from all quarters against the rash preachers who were preventing helvetia from quietly selling the blood of her sons to the stranger on the twenty second of july as oswald myconius was entertaining canon kilchmeyer and several other friends of the gospel at dinner a boy sent by zwinglius knocked at the door he was the bearer of the two famous petitions from einsiedlen and of a letter from zwinglius which requested oswald to circulate them in lucerne my advice is that the thing be done quietly by degrees rather than all at once but for the love of christ it is necessary to forsake everything even wife thus the crisis approached in lucerne 
the shell had fallen and could not but burst the guests read the petitions may god bless this beginning said oswald looking up to heaven and then added this prayer must from this moment be the constant occupation of our hearts the petitions were forthwith circulated perhaps with more ardour than zwinglius had requested but the moment was singular eleven individuals the flower of the clergy had placed themselves in the breach it was necessary to enlighten men's minds to fix the irresolute and gain over the most influential members of the diet oswald in the midst of this labour did not forget his friend the young messenger had told him of the attacks which zwinglius had to endure from the monks at zurich writing to him the same day he says the truth of the holy spirit is invincible armed with the shield of the holy scriptures you have remained conqueror not in one combat only nor in two but in three and the fourth is now commencing seize those powerful weapons which are harder than diamond christ in order to protect his people has need only of his word your struggles give indomitable courage to all who have devoted themselves to jesus christ at lucerne the petitions did not produce the result anticipated some pious men approved of them but these were few in number several fearing to compromise themselves were unwilling either to praise or blame these folks said others will never bring this affair to a good end all the priests murmured grumbled and muttered between their teeth as to the people they were loud against the gospel a rage for war was awakened in lucerne after the bloody defeat of beacock and engrossed all thoughts oswald who was an attentive observer of these different impressions felt his courage shaken the evangelical future which he had anticipated for lucerne and switzerland seemed to vanish our people said he uttering a deep sigh are blind to the things of heaven in regard to the glory of christ there is no hope of the swiss wrath prevailed especially in the council and the diet the pope france england and all the empire all around switzerland was in agitation after the defeat of beacock and the evacuation of lombardy by the french under lautrec were not political interests at that moment complicated enough before these eleven men came with their petitions to mingle religious questions with them the deputies of zurich alone were favourably disposed to the gospel canon xylotect afraid for his own life and that of his wife he had married into one of the first families in the country had refused with tears of regret to repair to einsiedlen and sign the addresses canon kilchmeyer had shown greater courage he too had everything to fear condemnation threatens me he writes to zwinglius on the thirteenth of august i await it without fear as he was writing these words an officer of the council entered the room and cited him to appear next day if they put me in irons said he continuing his letter i claim your help but it will be easier to transport a rock from our alps than to move me a finger's breadth from the word of jesus christ the regard which was deemed due to his family and the resolution which they had taken to let the storm fall upon oswald saved the canon berthold haller perhaps because he was not a swiss had not signed the petitions but full of courage he like zwinglius expounded the gospel according to st matthew a vast crowd filled the cathedral of bern the word of god operated more powerfully on the people than manuel's dramas haller was summoned to the town house the people accompanied their good-natured pastor and remained around the spot the council was divided this concerns the bishop said the leading men the preacher must be handed over to my lord of lausanne the friends of haller trembled at these words and told him to withdraw as quickly as possible the people flocked round and accompanied him to his house where a great number of burghers remained in arms prepared to make a rampart of their bodies in defence of their humble pastor the bishop and council were overawed by this energetic demonstration and haller was saved haller was not the only combatant at bern 
Sebastian Meyer at this time refuted the pastoral letter of the Bishop of Constance, and in particular the formidable charge that the gospelers teach a new doctrine, but that the old doctrine is the true. To be wrong for two thousand years, said Meyer, is not to be right for a single hour, otherwise the heathen ought to have hid to their belief. If the most ancient doctrines must carry the day, fifteen hundred years are more than five hundred years, and the gospel is more ancient than the ordinances of the Pope. At this period the magistrates of Freiburg intercepted letters addressed to Haller and Meyer by a canon of Freiburg named John Hollard, a native of Orb. They imprisoned, then deposed, and at last banished him. John Vanius, a chorister in the cathedral, shortly after embraced the evangelical doctrine, for in the Christian warfare one soldier no sooner falls than another takes his place. How could the muddy water of the Tiber, said Vanius, subsist beside the pure water which Luther has drawn from the spring of St. Paul? But the chorister's mouth was also closed. Myconius wrote to Zwinglius, Scarcely will you find in Switzerland men more averse to the gospel than the Freiburgers. Lucerne ought to have been stated as an exception. This Myconius knew. He had not signed the famous petitions, but his friends had if he had not, and a victim was required. The ancient literature of Greece and Rome began, thanks to him, to shed some light in Lucerne. Numbers arrived from different quarters to attend the learned professor, and the friends of peace were charmed with sounds sweeter than those of halberds, swords, and cuirasses, which alone had hitherto resounded in the warlike city. Oswald had sacrificed everything for his country. He had quitted Zurich and Zwinglius. He had lost his health. His wife was pining. His son was in childhood. If even Lucerne rejected him, he could nowhere hope for an asylum. But no matter. Factions have no pity, and the thing which ought to excite their compassion stimulates their rage. Herbenstein, burgomaster of Lucerne, an old and valiant warrior who had gained a distinguished name in the wars of Swabia and Burgundy, followed up the deposition of the teacher, and wished to banish from the canton with himself his Greek, his Latin, and his gospel. He succeeded. On coming out of the council, after the sederunt at which Myconius had been deposed, Herbenstein met the Zurich deputy, Bergoy. "'We are sending you back to your schoolmaster,' said he to him, ironically. "'Get a good lodging for him.' "'We won't let him sleep in the open air,' immediately replied the courageous deputy. But Bergoy promised more than he could perform. The news given by the burgomaster were but too true, and were soon intimated to the unhappy Myconius. He is deposed and banished, and the only crime laid to his charge is that of being a disciple of Luther. He looks all around, but nowhere finds a shelter. He sees his wife, his son, and himself, all three feeble and sickly, exiled from their country, and Switzerland all around agitated by a whirlwind which breaks and destroys everything that stands in its way. Here, said he then to Zwinglius, is poor Myconius banished by the council of Lucerne. Whither shall I go? I know not. Assailed yourself by these furious storms, how could you shelter me? I cry then, in my distress, to that God who is the first in whom I hope, who is ever bountiful, ever kind, and who never calls upon any to seek his face in vain. May he supply my wants. Thus spoke Oswald, and he was not obliged to wait long for a word of consolation. There was one in Switzerland inured to the battles of the faith. Zwinglius drew near to his friend, and, comforting him, thus expressed himself, the blows by which men attempt to overthrow the house of God are so violent, and the assaults which they make upon it so frequent, that not only do the wind and rain beat upon it, as our Saviour predicted, Matthew 7, verse 27, but the hail and the thunder. Had I not perceived the Lord guiding the ship, I should, long ere now, have cast the helm into the sea, 
but i see him amid the tempest strengthening the tackling arranging the yards stretching the sails what do i say commanding the very winds should i not then be a coward unworthy of the name of a man if i abandoned my post and fled to a shameful death i confide entirely in his sovereign goodness let him govern transport hasten retard precipitate arrest break down let him even plunge us to the bottom of the abyss we fear nothing we are vessels which belong to him he can use us as he pleases for honour or disgrace after words thus full of faith zwinglius continues as to your case this is my opinion present yourself before the council and there deliver an address worthy of christ and of yourself that is to say proper to touch and not to irritate men's hearts deny that you are a disciple of luther declare that you are a disciple of jesus christ let your pupils surround you and let them speak and if all this does not succeed come to your friend come to zwinglius and consider our home as your own fireside oswald strengthened by these words followed the noble counsel of the reformer but all his efforts were useless the witness to the truth behoved to quit his country his enemies in lucerne were so loud against him that the magistrates would not allow any one to give him an asylum broken-hearted at the sight of so much enmity the confessor of jesus christ exclaimed all that now remains for me is to beg from door to door to sustain my miserable life shortly after the friend and most powerful assistant of zwinglius the first man in switzerland who had united literary instruction with the love of the gospel the reformer of lucerne and at a later period one of the leaders of the helvetic church was obliged with his sickly wife and little boy to quit this ungrateful city where out of all his family the only one who had received the gospel was a sister he crossed its ancient bridges and bade adieu to those mountains which seemed to rise from the bosom of the lake of Wolstetten up to the clouds canons xylotect and kilchmeyer the only friends whom the reformation yet numbered among his countrymen followed shortly after and at the moment when this poor man with two feeble companions whose existence depended on him with his eye turned towards its lake and shedding tears for his deluded country took leave of those sublime scenes which had surrounded his cradle the gospel itself took leave of lucerne and rome reigns in it to this day shortly after the diet itself which was assembled at baden stung by the petitions of einsiedlen which being printed produced a great sensation and urged by the bishop of constance to strike a blow at innovations had recourse to measures of persecution ordered the authorities of the villages to bring before it all priests and laymen who should speak against the faith seized in its impatience on the evangelist who happened to be nearest at hand urban vice pastor of philipsbach who had been previously released on caution made him be brought to constance and then gave him up to the bishop by whom he was long kept in prison thus says the chronicle of bullinger the persecution of the gospel by the confederates commenced and that at the instigation of the clergy who have at all times delivered jesus christ to herod and pilate zwinglius was not to escape his share of trial blows to which he was most sensible were then struck at him the rumour of his doctrines and his contests had passed santis penetrated the tockenberg and reached the heights of wildhaus the pastoral family from whom the reformer had sprung were moved of the four brothers of zwinglius some had continued peacefully to occupy themselves with their mountain toils whilst others to the great grief of their brother had quitted their flocks and served foreign princes all were alarmed at the news which rumour brought as far as their chalets they already saw their brother seized dragged perhaps to constance to his bishop and a pile erected for him at the same place which had consumed the body of john huss these proud shepherds could not bear the idea of being called the brother of a heretic they wrote to ulrich describing their sorrow and their fears zwinglius replied 
so long as god permits i will perform the task which he has entrusted to me without fearing the world and its proud tyrants i know the worst that can happen to me there is no danger no misfortune which i have not long carefully weighed my own strength is mere nothingness and i know the power of my enemies but i know also that i can do everything through christ strengthening me were i silent some other would be constrained to do what god now does by me and i would be punished by god cast far from you all your anxiety my dear brothers if i have a fear it is that i have been gentler and more easily persuaded than is suitable for this age what shame you say will be cast on all our family if you are burnt or put to death in some other way o oh, dearly beloved brethren the gospel derives from the blood of christ this wondrous nature that the most violent persecutions far from arresting only hasten its progress those only are true soldiers of christ who fear not to bear in their body the wounds of their master all my labours have no other end than to make men know the treasures of happiness which christ has acquired for us in order that all may flee to the father through the death of his son if his doctrine offends you your anger cannot stop me you are my brothers yes my own brothers the sons of my father and the offspring of the same mother but if you are not my brethren in christ and in the work of faith my grief would be so extreme that nothing could equal it adieu i will never cease to be your true brother provided you do not yourselves cease to be the brethren of jesus christ the confederates seemed to rise against the gospel as one man the petitions of einsiedlen had been the signal zwinglius concerned for the lot of his dear myconius saw in this misfortune only the beginning of calamity enemies in zurich enemies abroad a man's own relatives becoming his enemies a furious opposition on the part of monks and priests violent measures of the diet and the councils rude perhaps bloody assaults on the part of the partisans of foreign service the highest valleys of switzerland the cradle of the confederation sending forth phalanxes of invincible soldiers to save rome and at the sacrifice of life annihilating the growing faith of the sons of the reformation such was the prospect at which the penetrating mind of the reformer shuddered when he beheld it in the distance what a prospect was not the work scarcely well begun on the point of being destroyed zwinglius thoughtful and agitated spread all his anguish before his god o oh, jesus said he you see how wicked men and blasphemers stun the ears of thy people with their cries thou knowest that from my infancy i have hated disputes and yet in spite of myself thou hast ceased not to urge me on to the combat wherefore i confidently call upon thee as thou hast begun so to finish if in anything i have built up improperly beat it down with thy mighty hand if i have laid some other foundation beside thine let thy powerful arm overthrow it o most beloved vine of which the father is the vine dresser and of which we are the branches forsake not thine offspring for thou hast promised to be with us even to the end of the world it was on the twenty second of august fifteen hundred and twenty two that ulrich zwinglius the reformer of switzerland when he saw violent storms descending from the mountains on the frail bark of faith thus expressed the troubles and hopes of his soul in the presence of his god end of book eight chapter fourteen End of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume 2, by Jean-Henri Mail d'Aubigné, translated by Henry Beveridge. Recording by Christopher Smith, completed September 2018.